Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Wes Weimer, who's going to be, uh, who's visiting us with uh, Stephanie Forrest. And Wes is going to talk today about automatically uh, repairing bugs and programs. Excellent. <clears throat> okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about automatically finding patches using genetic programming, or to put it another way, automatically repairing programs using genetic programming. And this is joint work with Stephanie Forrest from the University of New Mexico and our grad students, Claire and Vu. <clears throat> so in an incredible surprise move for uh, Microsoft researchers, I will claim that software quality remains a key problem. And there's an oft-quoted statistic from the past that suggests that over one half of 1% of the US GDP uh, goes to software bugs each year. Would appear that there are people in the audience familiar with this statistic. And that programs tend to ship with known bugs, often hundreds or thousands of them that are uh, triaged to be important, but perhaps not worth fixing with the resources available. What we want to do is reduce the cost of debugging, reduce the cost associated with fixing bugs that have already been identified in programs. Previous research suggests that bug reports that are accompanied by an explanatory patch, even if it's tool created, even if it might not be perfect, are more likely to be addressed rapidly. That is, that it takes developers uh, less time and effort to either uh, apply them or change them around a bit and then apply them. So what we want to do is automate this patch generation for defects. In essence, to transform a program with a bug into a program without a bug, but only by modifying small relevant parts of the program. So the big thesis for this work is that we can automatically and efficiently repair certain classes of defects in off-the-shelf, unannotated legacy programs. So we're going to be taking existing C programs like FTP servers, send mail, web servers, that's, that sort of thing, and try to repair defects in them. The basic idea for how we're going to do this is to consider the program and then generate random variants, explore the search space of all programs close to that program until we find one that repairs the problem. Intuitively, though, this search space might be very large. So we're going to bring a number of insights to bear to sort of shrink this search space to focus our search. The first key part is that we're going to be using existing test cases both to uh, focus our search on a certain path through the program, but also to tell if we're doing a good job with automatically creating these variants. And we'll assume that the program has a set of test cases, possibly a regression test suite, that encodes required functionality, right? that makes sure that the program is doing the right thing. And we'll use those test cases to evaluate potential variants. In essence, we prefer variants that pass more of these test cases. Then we're going to search by randomly perturbing parts of the program likely to contain the defects. You might have a large program, but we hypothesize that it's unlikely that every line in the program is equally likely to contribute to the defect. We're going to try to narrow down, localize the fault, as it were, and only make modifications in specific areas. <clears throat> so how does this process work out? You give us as input the source code to your program, standard C program, as well as some regression tests that you currently pass that encode required behavior. So for example, if your program is a web server, these uh, positive regression test cases might encode things like proper behavior when someone asks you to get index.html. Basic stuff like that. In addition, you have to codify or quantify for us the bug that you want us to repair. So there's some input upon which the program doesn't do the right thing. It loops forever, it's seg faults, it's vulnerable to some sort of security attack. And by taking a step back, we can actually view that as another test case, but one that you don't currently pass. Right? So there's some input, we have some expected output, but we don't currently give the expected output. We then loop for a while doing genetic programming work. We create random variants of the program. We run them on the test cases to see how close they are to what we're looking for. And we repeat this process over and over again, retaining variants that pass a lot of the test cases, and possibly combining or mutating them together. <clears throat> at the end of the day, we either find a program variant that passes all of the test cases, at which point we win. We declare moral victory. We uh, take a look at the new program source code and perhaps uh, take a diff of it in the, in the original program, and that becomes our patch. 
Or we might give up, since this is a random or heuristic search process, after a certain number of iterations or after a certain amount of time and say, we're unable to find a solution. We can't repair the program given these resource bounds. <clears throat> so for this talk, I will speak ever so briefly about genetic programming, what it is, what those, word means, what those words mean, and then talk about uh, one key insight that we use to limit the search space, our notion of the weighted path. And this is where we're going to look for uh, the fault or the defect in the program. I'll give an example of a program that we might repair, an example perhaps near and dear to the hearts of people in this audience. And then I'll present two sets of experiments. One designed in general to show that we can repair uh, many different programs with sort of large, or large and different uh, classes of defects. And one to try to get at the quality of the repairs that we produce. Would anyone trust them? Are they like what humans would do? Might they cause you to uh, lose transactions or miss important work if you were to implement our proposed patches? Sir? What, you don't have any guarantee, but what at least statistical guarantees or any kind of guarantee that your patch will not create additional problems. All right. So the question was, do we have any guarantees at all that our patch will not create additional problems? At the lowest level, we only consider patches that pass all of the regression tests that you've provided for us. So if there's some important behavior that you want to make sure that we hold inviolate, you need only write a test case for it. And in some sense, coming up with an adequate set of test cases is an orthogonal software engineering problem that I won't address here, but I will acknowledge that it's difficult. However, it is entirely possible uh, that a patch that we propose might be parlayed into a different kind of error. For example, uh, in one of the programs that we repair, there's a non-buffer overflow based denial of service attack where people can send malformed packets that aren't too long that uh, cause the program to crash, to fail some sort of assertion. We might repair this by removing the assertion, but now the program might continue on and, uh, yeah, and do bad things. <clears throat> so it's, it's possible uh, that the patches that we generate could introduce new, new security vulnerabilities. We will get to this later in the talk. It's an excellent question and you should be wary. Yes? Do you make any assumptions about the impact of the uh, bug on the program state? I mean, do you assume that it affects local state or global state or the solution is orthogonal to the right. The question was, do we make any assumptions about the impact of the bug on program state, local, global? Uh, and in general, no. I'll give you a feel for the kind of uh, patches and the kind of defects that we're able to repair. Uh, many of them, such as uh, buffer overrun vulnerabilities, uh, integer overflow attacks, deal with relatively local state. Uh, but nothing in the technique assumes or requires that. Good question. Other questions while we're here? Okay. So we'll do some experiments on repair quality, which will potentially uh, address some of these concerns, but not all of them. And then there'll be a big finish. <clears throat> so genetic programming uh, formally is the application of evolutionary or genetic algorithms to program source code. And whenever you talk about uh, genetic algorithms, at least in my mind, there are three important sort of concepts you want to get across. You need to maintain a population of variants. And you need to modify these programs, perhaps with operations such as crossover and mutation. And then you need to be able to evaluate the variants to tell which ones uh, are, uh, are closer to what you're hoping for. And here, for a sort of Microsoft Research localized example, uh, Roost and Leno wasn't able to make it to the talk, but I did get a chance to speak with him yesterday. Here are a population of variants as sort of four copies of Roost and Leno. And then we make small modifications. So for example, some are standing up, some are sitting down, some have a pitcher of apple juice. And at the end of the day, we have to tell which we prefer. So for example, if we're very thirsty, we might prefer the Roost with the apple juice, right? We're going to do this, except that we're going to fix programs instead. <clears throat> Many of you might be uh, wary of the application of genetic programming or genetic algorithms or machine learning uh, to programming languages or software engineering tasks. You might have seen these things done uh, in a less than principled manner in the past. <clears throat> Another way to view our work is as search-based software engineering where we're using the regression test cases to guide the search. They guide both where we make the modifications and also how we tell when we're done. Uh, the picture <clears throat> says, uh, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Uh, so it's a quote from Shakespeare about the naming of things and whether or not that matters. But the font is small and hard to read. Good question. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> so how does this end up working? In some sense, there are two secret sauces that allow us to scale. <laughs> Our main claim is that in a large program, not every line is equally likely to contribute to the bug. 
And since we required as input indicative test cases, regression tests to make sure that we're on the right track, the insight is to actually run them and collect coverage information. So we might do something as simple as instrumenting the program to print out which lines it visits. And we hypothesize that the bug is more likely to be found on lines that are visited when you feed in the erroneous input. Right? Lines that are visited during sort of the execution of the negative test case. For, yes? I'm surprised we have a guy who does statistical studies. And he found that the bugs are statistically in those places which are especially covered. <laughs> One intuitive explanation that those places probably were written by poor programmers. And there was a lot of bugs found there. And so they were again and again uh, sort of uh, visited. Endless source of bugs. <laughs> uh, so there was a, a comment or a, a suggestion that uh, even lines of code that are visited many times might still contain bugs. And we're not going to uh, rule out uh, portions of the code that are visited along these positive test cases, but we might uh, weight them less. And while Tom Ball is not here, uh, he and many other researchers have uh, looked into fault localization. And to some degree, what I'm going to propose is a very coarse-grained fault localization. We might imagine using uh, any sort of off-the-shelf fault localization technique. One of the reasons that we are perhaps uh, not tempted to do so is that we want to be able to repair sins of omission. So if the problem with your program is that you've forgotten a call, you've forgotten a call to free or forgotten a call to sanitize, we still want to be able to repair that. But uh, many, but not all, fault localization techniques tend to have trouble with bugs that aren't actually present in the code. It's hard to pin, um, uh, it's hard to pin sins of omission down to a particular line. Uh, so we'll start with this, and then later on I will talk about areas where fault localization or other statistical techniques might help us. Good question. Yes? Um, the, the third bullet point is uh, puzzling me. So you say the bug is more likely to be found mm -hmm. when you're running the failed test case. So there are also passing test cases. Right. If you, I mean, if you don't run so. the code, then you... So we assume that you give us a number of regression test cases that you pass currently, and also one new, we call it the negative test case, that encodes the bug, some input on which you crash or get the wrong output. Right? And these uh, existing positive regression test cases are assumed to encode desired behavior. Right? So we can only repair programs for which a test suite is available. But there might be some techniques for automatically generating test cases. Yes? I'm confused about the deployment scenario here. So is this meant to be something you deploy during debugging the code? Or you observe a failure in the field, you collect some crash dump, and then you use this for post-processing. Which of these? All right, so the question was about the deployment scenario. And in some sense, my answer to this is going to be both. Our official story, especially at the beginning of the talk, is that we want to reduce the effort required for human developers to debug something. And we're going to uh, present to them a candidate patch that they can look at, and that might reduce the amount of time it takes them to come up with a real patch. So we assume maybe the bug is in the database, there are some steps to reproduce it, you run our tool, and five minutes later we give you a candidate patch. However, our second set of experiments will involve a, uh, a deployment scenario where we remove humans from the loop and assume that some sort of long-running service has to stay up for multiple days, and there we want to uh, detect, perhaps with anomaly or intrusion detection, uh, faults as they arrive and then try to repair them. So we will address that second scenario later. Excellent question, though. Other questions while we're here? <clears throat> so we have the test cases, we run them, we notice what parts of the program you visit. We claim uh, that when we're running this erroneous input that causes the program to crash or get the wrong answer, uh, that it's likely that those lines have something to do with the bug. However, many programs have, uh, let's say, a lot of initialization code at the beginning that's common. Maybe you set up some matrix the same way every time or read some user configuration file. And that might be code that you visit both on this uh, negative test case when you're experiencing the bug, but also on all other positive test cases. We want to, or we hypothesize, that those lines are slightly less likely to be associated with the bug. <clears throat> In addition, as we're going around making modifications to the program, we might sometimes delete lines, which is relatively simple, but we might also be tempted to uh, insert or replace code. And when we do, if you're going to insert a line into a C program, there are a large number of statements or expressions you might choose from, infinite in fact. <clears throat> One of the other reasons uh, that we scale is we're going to restrict the search space here to code that's already present in the program. In essence, we hypothesize that the program contains the seeds of its own repair. 
that if the problem with your program is, for example, uh, a null pointer dereference or an array out of bounds access, that probably somewhere else in your program you have a null check or you have an array bounds check. Uh, following, for example, the intuition of Dawson Engler, Bugs' deviant behavior, it's likely that the programmer gets it right many times, but not every time. So rather than trying to invent new code, we're going to copy code from other parts of your program uh, to try to fix the bug. And I will revisit that assumption later. <clears throat> so we wanted to narrow down the search space, and our formalism for doing this is a weighted path. And relatively simply, for us, a weighted path is a list of statement and weight pairs where conceptually the weight represents the likelihood or the probability uh, that that statement is related to the bug, it's related to the defect. In all of our experiments, we use the following weighted path. The statements are those that are visited during the failed test case, when we are running the buggy input. The weights are either very high, if that's a statement that's only visited on the bug-inducing input and not on any other test case, and relatively low if it's also visited on the other past test cases, if it's that matrix initialization code that's global to all runs of the program. Sir? The weights only take one of these two values, 1.0 and 1.2. <clears throat> and the question was, do the weights only take these values, 1.0 and 0 0.1? For the experiments that I will be uh, presenting today, yes. We have uh, investigated other weights. Uh, so another approach, for example, would be to make this 0 0.1 a 0, 0.0 to just uh, throw out uh, lines in the program that are also visited on the, on the positive test case. And for some runs of our tool, uh, we try different parameter values. In practice, these are the uh, highest performing uh, parameters that we found, but with a very small search. It, it seems that um, our algorithm is, in some sense, relatively insensitive to what uh, these values actually are. Rather than the list. So, what makes it least path? Ah, uh, the, the question was about the terminology. Uh, it's a, a list of statement weight pairs. Why do I call it a weighted path? And the reason is that it's the path through the program, potentially around loops or through if statements, uh, visited when we execute the failed test case. So, it corresponds to a path through the program. Uh, but when we throw away the abstract syntax tree, uh, a path is just a list of steps that you took forward and then left and whatnot. Does this answer your question? Yes. So, fail a test case is as simple as the assignment to the inputs, or uh, do you also, or the, the, does the user also specify why does this test case fail? So, some output variable should have some other value instead. All right. So, the question is, what is a test case? Uh, and I will get to this at the end and show you uh, a concrete example of a test case from ours. But officially, we follow the Oracle comparator model from software engineering, uh, where a test case is <clears throat> an input that you feed to the program and it produces new output. But you also have an Oracle somewhere that tells you what the right output should have been. And in regression testing, the Oracle output is often uh, running the same input on the last version. Then there's also a comparator, which could be something very strict like diff or compare, which would notice if even one byte were off. Uh, but for something like graphics, for example, your comparator might be more fuzzy. You might say, oh, if part of the picture is blurry, that, that doesn't matter as long as the sum of the squares of the distance is less than blah, blah, blah. For all of the uh, test cases that I'll present experiments on, uh, we followed a very simple regression test methodology. We ran the sort of vanilla or the correct version of the program and wrote down the correct output, all of the output that the program produced. And in order to pass the test case, you had to give exactly that, no more, no less. Uh, but in theory, if you wanted to only care about certain output variables, uh, our system supports that. So, am I correct in understanding you don't care how many times a statement is executed? All you care about is whether it is executed or not. All right. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, do we care how many times a statement is executed? Is this really a list or is it actually a set? And in our implementation, it's actually a list. If you go around a loop multiple times, uh, we will record that you've visited those statements uh, more often than before. So we might be uh, more likely to look there when we're performing modifications. I'm not going to talk about our, uh, I will skip over our crossover operator, although I will be happy to answer questions about it in this talk. Uh, but in essence, it, uh, it requires sort of an, an ordered list uh, and potentially might care about duplicates. We have investigated, and uh, there are options available for our tool, for our prototype implementation of this, uh, treating this list as a set, not considering duplicates. The advantage of this, is, the advantage of a set-based approach is that it reduces the search space. Right? Uh, the disadvantage is that we might be throwing away frequency information about which statements are actually visited more. So the question is, do you want sort of a larger search space but with a pointer in the right direction, or do you want a smaller search space that you're choosing from at random? 
statement, you would have just a multiplicity. Uh, and we could implement this using a multiset, yes. Um, but the, uh, the actual uh, sort of data structure bookkeeping of our algorithm uh, ends up not being the dominant cost of this, and I'll get into that in a bit. <clears throat> yes? Ah, uh, so initially, so the question was, uh, this seems to only care about uh, the passing test cases. But the set of statements that we consider are only those visited during failed test cases. So you can imagine that statements visited during neither passed nor failed test cases implicitly get a weight of zero. Right? Uh, and then of those statements during uh, uh, failed test cases, uh, if they're only visited on the failed test case, they get high probability, otherwise they get low. So both the, uh, the positive test cases and the negative test cases matter, and I have a graphical example to show in a bit. <clears throat> so uh, once we've introduced the weighted path, I can now go back and fit everything we're doing into a genetic programming framework. Need to tell you what our population of variants is, and for this, every, uh, every variant program that we produce is a pair of a standard abstract syntax tree and also a weighted path. And the weighted path, again, uh, focuses our mutations or our program modifications, tells us where we're going to make the changes. Once we have a bunch of these variants, we might want to modify or mutate them. And to mutate a variant, we randomly choose a statement from the weighted path only, biased by the weights. So we're more likely to pick a statement with a high weight. Once we've chosen that statement, we might delete it, we might replace it with another statement, or we might insert another statement before or after it. When we come up with these new statements, rather than making them up out of whole cloth, we copy them from other parts of the program. This reduces the search space and helps us to scale. And again, this assumes that the program contains the seeds of its own repair, that there's a null check somewhere else that we can bring over to help us out. <clears throat> We have a crossover operator that I'm not going to describe, but will happily answer questions about. Uh, in some sense, it uh, is a relatively traditional one-point crossover. Once we have come up with our variants, we want to evaluate them. Are they any good? Are they passing the test cases? We use the regression test cases and the buggy test case as our fitness function. We have our abstract syntax tree. We pretty print it out to a C program, pass it to GCC. If it doesn't compile, we give it a fitness of zero. Now, since we're working on the abstract syntax tree, we're never going to get unbalanced parentheses. We'll never have syntax errors. But we might copy the use of a variable outside the scope of its definition, so we might fail to type check. If the program fails to compile for whatever reason, we give it a fitness of zero. Otherwise, we simply run it on the test cases, and its fitness is the number or fraction of test cases that it passes. We might do something like uh, weighting the uh, buggy test case more than all of the regression tests, if there are many regression tests, but only one uh, way to reproduce the bug. <clears throat> uh, but in general, you can imagine this just counting the number of test cases passed. Once we do that, we know the fitness of every variant. We want to retain higher fitness variants into the next generation. Those might be crossed over with others. And we repeat this process until we find a solution, until we find a variant that passes every test case, or until enough time has passed and we give up. Compile if you uh, if the variable is not defined in the scope and you copy it. Yes. But it's also possible that the variable is redefined in the scope with the same name, or maybe it's a pointer that points to some other object in the interim period. And yes. Like, do, you, do you consider those cases? As no. We just let them happen. Right? And presumably, so let's imagine, we move a use of a variable into a scope that also uses a different variable with the same name. So now we're going to get, in essence, random behavior. Right? Hopefully, we'll fail a bunch of the test cases so we won't keep that variant around. Right? On the other hand, that random, vari random behavior might be just what we need to fix the bug. Unlikely, but possible. So we'll consider it, but probably it won't pass the test cases so it won't survive till the next generation. <clears throat> so. I'm going to give a concrete example of how this works using idealized source code from uh, the Microsoft Zune Media Player. And uh, many of you are perhaps familiar with uh, this code or code like it. December 31st, 2008, uh, some news sources say millions of these Zune players uh, froze up. And <clears throat> in many reports, uh, the calculation that led to the freeze was something like this. We have a method that's interested in converting uh, a raw count of days into what the current year is. And in essence, this is a while loop that subtracts 365 from the days and adds one to the years over and over again, but has some extra processing for handling leap years, right, where uh, the day count is slightly different. 
to see what might go wrong with this, the infinite loop that causes the players to lock up, imagine that we come in and days is exactly 366. We're going to go into the while loop. Let's say the current year, 1980, is a leap year. Right? If days is greater than 366, well, it's not greater than. It's exactly equal to. So instead, we'll go into this empty else branch, which I've sort of drawn out for expository purposes. Right? Nothing happens. We go around the loop. And we'll go around the loop over and over again, uh, never incrementing or decrementing variables. We loop forever. Right? We want to repair this defect automatically. <clears throat> so our first step is to convert it to an abstract syntax tree. And uh, it should look similar to before, assignments to here. We have this big while loop. <clears throat> and what I want to do is figure out which parts of this abstract syntax tree are likely to be associated with the bug. We want to find our weighted path. So our first step is to run the program on some bug-inducing input, like 10,593, which corresponds to December 31st, 2008. And I've highlighted in pink all of the nodes in the abstract syntax tree that we visit uh, on this negative test case. We loop forever, so notably we never get to the printf at the end. We visit all of the nodes except the last one. So this is some information, but not a whole lot. But now I also want to remove or weight less nodes that are visited on positive, passing regression test cases. So let's imagine that we know what the right answer is supposed to be when days equal 1,000. We have a regression test for it. I rerun the program and also mark, and here I'm marking in green, all of the nodes that were visited on positive test cases. And in some sense, the difference between them is going to be my weighted path. I'm going to largely restrict attention to just this node down here, which is visited on negative test case, but on no positive test cases. So here's my weighted path. Once I have the weighted path, I might randomly apply mutation operations, insertions, deletions, re replacements, but only to nodes along the weighted path. Let's imagine I, uh, I get relatively lucky the first time. I choose to do an insertion. Right? Where am I going to insert? I'm more or less stuck inserting here. And rather than inventing code whole cloth, I'm going to copy a statement from somewhere else in the program. So for example, I might copy this days minus equal 366 statement and insert it into this block. Once I do, the final code ends up looking somewhat like this. I now have a copy of that node. I've changed the program, slightly different abstract syntax tree. And this ends up being our final repair. It passes all of our previous test cases, and it doesn't loop forever on the negative test case. And in a, but, it, but it might not be what a human would have done, <clears throat> uh, and it might not, be, uh, might not be correct. Maybe our negative test case wasn't correct. So I'm going to talk a bit in a bit about repair quality. Yes? So how does this go with exception handling? Suppose you had an exception handler, and mm -hmm. that was triggered when you did the negative test case, right? Essentially, you would be trying to add code to the exception handler to make it uh, repair the bug, but the bug might be somewhere else in the program. And, right, so, 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 okay, so uh, this is a good point. Uh, for the implementation that we have here, we've been concentrating on uh, off-the-shelf C programs, uh, where in sort of standard, uh, uh, standard C, exception handling is not an option. We have previously published work for repairing uh, vulnerabilities if a specification is given. Right? Uh, and in that work, we specifically described how to uh, add or remove exception handling, either try catch or try finally statements, uh, in order to fix up type state uh, problems, for example. If we were going to move uh, this to, say, Java or some other language with exception handling, uh, we would probably try to carry over some of those ideas. Right. So we haven't implemented it yet. So for now, we don't support that. Uh, currently, our implementation is C. Uh, there are no uh, major problems preventing us from moving to other languages, but there are corner cases we would want to think about, such as exception handling. Uh, so, for example, if we were moving to a language with exception handling, we might want to consider uh, adding syntax like uh, try or catch or finally as atomic mutation actions. Right. More on that in a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so, before we get to repair quality, uh, just sort of a, a brief show of how this happened over time. On this graph, the, uh, uh, the dark bar shows the fitness we assigned to our, the average, our overall population of variance as time or as generation goes by. And in this particular version, we had five uh, normal regression test cases that were worth one point each. And we had uh, two uh, test cases that reproduced the bug. And passing those, that is not looping forever, getting the right answer, uh, was worth 10 points each. And we start off at five. We pass all of the normal regression tests, but none of the buggy tests. Right? After one generation, <clears throat> our score is now up at 10 or 11. We pass one of the buggy tests, but have lost key functionality. Right? We're no longer passing some of the regression tests. Right? We're at 12 instead of 15. 
And our, uh, our favorite variant, the variant that eventually goes on to become the solution, stays relatively uh, stable for a while. The others uh, sort of generally increase until eventually either it's mutated or it combines part of its solution with something else that's doing relatively well. And in this uh, seventh generation, <clears throat> it passes all of the regression test cases as well as the two bugs. So we think about this for a while. This is an iterative process. And then uh, hopefully at the end, we pass all the test cases. Yes? If something doesn't compile, you said you give it fit to zero, right? Yes. Is it, is it possible that you generate a lot of stuff that has fit to zero to find one thing that actually compiles? This is a great question. Um, and in fact, we have, uh, we have these numbers, although I did. That's not in this graph, right? That's not part of the graph. Uh, let us say uh, that less than half of the variants that we generate fail to compile. And I can get you the, uh, the actual numbers uh, right after this presentation. But if you were to operate on, say, source code as opposed to ACE, so it probably would be by a fraction. Uh, if we were to operate on source code and it was possible that we could make mistakes with balanced parentheses or curly braces, then it would be a much higher fraction. And we'll return to that in a bit. <clears throat> Um, so we maintain a population of variants, let's say uh, 40 random versions of the same program, and we will mutate all of them and then run them all on the test cases and then keep the top half, say, to form the next generation. Uh, and the average here is the average fitness of all 40 members of that generation, that population. So what's the intuition for why the best individual remains flat for a number of generations and then try to shaft? Uh, so I may defer some of this to the local expert, but uh, my answer would go along these lines. Genetic programming or genetic algorithms are a heuristic search strategy, somewhat like simulated annealing, that you would use to, uh, to explore a large space. And one of the reasons you would be tempted to use something like this instead of, say, Newton's method, is that you want to avoid the problems associated with hill climbing. You want to avoid getting stuck in a local maximum. And the <clears throat> crossover operation in genetic programming or genetic algorithms, which I haven't talked about, holds out the possibility of uh, combining information from one variant that's stuck in a local hill over here, let's say in the second part of the path, with another variant that's stuck in a hill over here, say in the first part of the path. We might take those two things and merge them together and suddenly jump up right? uh, and break out of the problems associated with local hill climbing. Uh, so the hope is that this, this is the sort of thing that we would get out of using this particular heuristic search strategy. But I will defer to the local expert. Great the only thing I'd say is you can see that there's still something happening in the population because the average is moving. So even though that individual was, it, it was good enough to keep being copied unchanged into the next generation, but it was no, obviously not the best individual left in the population. But then in the end, so between it, three and uh, four, nothing moved. You know, in, the, in the end, it, it was the individual that led to the, to the winner. The question was, between three and four, nothing moved. Between three and four, the averages didn't move. Uh, but the population size is, let's say, 40 or 80. So. <clears throat> so, sorry, the graph doesn't make sense. If it's the best individual, and this the score of 11, how can the mm -hmm. average be bigger than 11? So I must apologize for the misleading label here. Uh, in our terminology, the best individual is the one that eventually forms the repair. Eventually. So we're tracking a single person or a single individual from the dawn of time to the end. Yes. So the in you know about genetic algorithms, um, that's usually really hard to do, and it's an artifact to trace the evolution of a single individual, but it's an artifact of how we do our process. Yes. How long did it take in seconds? Um, for this particular repair, let's say 300 seconds. Uh, three or four slides from now, I will, uh, I will present quantitative results. Right. On average, uh, for any of the 15 programs that we can repair, the average time to repair is 600 seconds. <clears throat> so once we do this, we apply mutation for a while, we come up with a bunch of variants, we evaluate them by running them on the test cases. Eventually, we find one that passes all the test cases. This is our candidate for the repair. Our patch that we might present to developers is simply uh, the diff between the original program and the variant that passes all the test cases. We just pretty print it out and take the diff. However, random mutation may have added unneeded statements or uh, may have changed behavior that's not captured in any of your test cases. We might have inserted dead code or redundant computation. And we don't want to waste developer time with that. Right? The purpose of this was to give them something good to look at. 
<clears throat> so in essence, we're going to take a look at our diff or our patch, which is sort of a list of things to do to the program, and consider removing every line from the patch. If we did all of the patch except line 3, would that still be enough to make us pass all of the test cases? If so, then we don't need line 3. Then line 3 was redundant. And you could imagine trying all combinations, but that might be uh, computationally infeasible or take exponential time. Instead, we use the well-known delta debugging approach uh, to find a one minimal subset of the diff in n squared time, where one minimal means that if even a single line of the patch were removed, it wouldn't cause us to pass all of the test cases. <clears throat> so, and uh, once again, rather than working at the uh, raw concrete syntax level, rather than using standard diff, we use a tree structured diff algorithm, diff x in particular, to avoid problems with balanced curly braces where removing one would cause the patch to be invalid and not compile. <clears throat> Every line of the program rather than just the differences of the candidate with the original program because it seems to me that right then you look at lines that are actually in the original program. Um, you might now remove stuff that happens to be not necessary for on any of the test cases ah. but it was in the original program. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can give an example of this. <clears throat> Let's say that the original program is A, B, C, and the fix is A, B, D, something like that. Then our uh, first patch will be something like delete C and insert D at the appropriate location. Right? There are two parts of this patch. These are the only things that we're going to be considering when we minimize sets. So when we talk about minimizing the patch, the possibilities that we're considering are one alone, one, two, two, or none of these. So we're, we're never going to remove A. So we're not going to mistakenly go back and hurt the original program. Uh, it's, it's only among the changes that were uh, made by genetic algorithms we say, did we actually need all of those? Try to minimize the number of lines in the patch rather than the performance of it. I mean, what's the intuition for? So this is a great idea. Uh, this is a great question, and we have a number of ideas related to it. The question was, why are we trying to minimize the size of the patch and not some other objective? <clears throat> Our initial formulation of this was we wanted to present it to developers, and often when developers make patches to working code, you want to do the least harm. You want to touch as little as possible. Right? However, we have been considering applying this technique to other domains. For example, let's imagine that you're a graphics person interested in pixel or vertex shaders which are loaded onto uh, a graphics processor. Right? Those are small C programs. Rather than trying to repair them, might we try to use genetic programming or the same sort of mutation to create an optimized version of a vertex or pixel shader that is faster, but perhaps produces slightly blurrier output. But since it will be viewed by a human, we might not care. So here our test cases would be uh, not an exact match, but instead the L2 norm could be off by 10%. And rather than uh, favoring uh, the smallness of the change, we would favor the performance of the resulting program. Uh, so that is a good idea. We're certainly considering things like that. Uh, for now, for the basic presentation, we want to get to the essence of the defect to help the developer repair it. Uh, but even outside of the domain of graphics, say, uh, mm -hmm. the smallness of the change is not necessarily representative, representative of how impactful it might be. So suppose you change function foo that is called on, you know, dozens of paths, whereas, uh, you know, function bar is only called in one, something like that. And yes. Bar, you would favor <coughs> as far as fixing. Right. So the question was, a smaller change might influence a method that's called more frequently. Also at ICSI, one of my students will be presenting work on uh, statically predicting or statically guessing the relative dynamic execution frequency of paths. One of the other areas we've been considering for this is rather than breaking ties in terms of size, break, term, or break ties in terms of uh, this change is less likely to be executed in the real world. Right? Uh, so we might have a static way of uh, detecting that, or we might use the dynamic counts that we have from your existing regression test case, assuming they're indicative, uh, and use those to break the tie instead. Also a great idea. Other questions while we're here? Yeah. <clears throat> so does it work?
Yes. Uh, so here we have uh, initial results. All in all, we've been able to repair about 15 programs, totaling about 140,000 lines of code, off-the-shelf C programs. On the left, I have uh, the names of the programs. Some of them may well be familiar. WooFTPD is a favorite whipping boy for its many vulnerabilities. The PHP interpreter, graphical Tetris game, Flex, Indent, and DROF are standard sort of Unix utilities. Light HTTPD and Null HTTPD are web servers. And Open LDAP is a web-based directory authentication protocol. <clears throat> In the next column, we've got the lines of code. And for a number of these, Open LDAP, Light HTTPD, or PHP, uh, it's worth noting that we are not performing a whole program analysis. For these, <clears throat> we want to show that we can repair just a single module out of an entire program. Open LDAP is relatively large. We're only going to concentrate on modifying io.c. Perhaps someone has already been able to localize uh, the error to there. For the rest of these, graphical Tetris game, FTP server, uh, we perform as a whole program analysis. We merge the entire program together into one conceptual file and do the repair from there. So here's the lines of code that we operated on. The next column over shows something that's perhaps more relevant to us, the size of the weighted path. This can be viewed as a proxy for the size of the search space that we have to look through uh, in order to potentially find the repair. Recall that we only perform mutations, insertions, and deletions along this weighted path. <clears throat> as we uh, go through and create variants, we have to evaluate them. We apply our fitness function. We run all of the test cases against each variant to see how well it's doing. This ends up being the dominant performance cost in our approach. Running your entire test suite 55 times might actually take a significant amount of wall clock time, although it can be uh, parallelized at a number of levels. So in this column, we report the number of times we would have to run your entire test suite before we came up with this repair. And finally, on the right, I have a description of the sorts of defects that we're repairing. Initially, we started off by uh, reproducing results from the original fuzz testing work, which was on Unix utilities. You feed them garbage input, they crash. So for many of these, like uh, DRAW for indent, uh, we found a number of segmentation violations or infinite loops that we were able to repair. Then we moved more towards uh, security. We went back through... Uh, old security mailing lists, bug track, that kind of thing, and found exploits that people had posted, say, against web servers or against Open LDAP. And uh, for these sorts of things, PHP, Atris, Light HTTPD, Open LDAP, uh, the negative test case is a published exploit by some black hat, uh, and then we try to repair the program until it's immune to that. So defects include things as varied as format string vulnerabilities, integer overflows, uh, stack and heap buffer overflows, segmentation violations, infinite loops, non-overflow denials of service. Yes? I was just going to ask, what is the size of the test suite in each case? Ah, this is a good question. So for many of these, we were able to get away with relatively small test suites. Let's say five or six test cases that encode required behavior. However, uh, in many cases, we expect there to be more test cases available rather than less. Uh, so I'll return to test case prioritization or test case reduction or our scaling behavior as test cases uh, increase in just a bit. For right now, we're only using five or six test cases, and we're still able to come up with decent repairs. So you said that you were able to run 15 programs. Yes. Out of how many you're trying? Uh, of the first 15 we tried, uh, in some sense, everything we tried succeeded, although recently we have found a number of programs that we're unable to succeed at. We might be unable, we might be unable to succeed at. You also tested the new, the, after the repair, you were still able to use the, the this software. Is, this is such a great idea that it will occur two slides from now. We will, we will test in just a bit uh, whether or not we can use the software after applying the repair. So excellent idea. Yes? How do we read the fitness numbers? Uh, how do we read the fitness numbers? This is the number of times I had to run your entire test case, your entire test suite, before I came up with the repair. So for example, to fix the format string vulnerability in WooFTPD, I had to run its test suite 55 times. Other lessons to be learned from looking at uh, intent, for instance, which is deleting that. Yes. <clears throat> uh, yes, there are such lessons. I will get to them on the next slide. We'll talk about scalability in just a bit. Yes. Uh, so, what was the relative size of the patch for each of these? <clears throat> After minimization, the average patch size was four to five lines. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we, ten we tended to be able to fix things, or we tended to produce fixes that were relatively local. And I'll talk about that qualitatively in a bit. Often our repairs were not what a human would have done. Uh, it's relatively easy to, to, to take a negative case and make it uh, 
you know, not, not succeed because if you, if you change, say, the, make, make a small change in the layout of the objects, chances are the black hat attacker's code is just mm -hmm. going to break. So, uh, I'm not sure. So, so, what is your metric for success there? I mean, is it that you get rid of the vulnerability or just the attack? All right. Uh, so, the question was for a number of security attacks, they're relatively fragile and any small change might defeat them. Uh, to some degree, great, uh, if a small change does defeat it. Uh, less facetiously, for many of these, uh, for OpenLDAP or for PHP, or, for example, uh, we searched around until we found an exploit that was relatively sophisticated. For example, exploits that did automatic searching for stack offsets and layouts, uh, so that even if we changed uh, the size of the stack, they would still succeed. For the format string vulnerability one, we used an exploit that searched dynamically for legitimate format strings, often finding ones that were uh, 300 characters long or whatnot. Uh, so, the relatively simple changes where you add a single character and now the, the executable is one byte larger and it's immune, uh, we tried to come up with uh, negative test cases that would see through that. Right? Uh, another way to approach that is uh, we also manually inspected, uh, and we described this in the XC paper, uh, all of the resulting repairs and are able to tell uh, whether or not a similar attack would succeed. And in general, what actually happens is we do defeat the attack, but only there. Let's imagine that you have a buffer overrun vulnerability uh, rampant throughout your code, and your negative test case shows one particular read that can take over. We'll fix that one read, but not the three others. But along that same line, there's a trivial solution to the problem, which is much simpler than all this. It's just if you, there are some specific inputs that you don't want, not, you don't want, just block those, and that's it. Right. So it's such a, not only it's faster, it's 100% precise with respect to that specific test suite, and second, in the, the sunny day case, the passing test, you're sure that the functionality hasn't been added to it. Right. What's wrong with that? <clears throat> so Patrice is describing fast signature generation, uh, an approach that we find orthogonal to ours. There is nothing wrong with signature generation. We like it a lot. In fact, we want to encourage you to use it to buy us time to come up with a real repair. Right? Uh, so one of the tricks with fast and precise signature generation is that you actually often can't get all of those adjectives at the same time. Uh, if you are just blocking that particular input, then uh, the black hat changes one character and they get past you or whatnot. If you're trying to block a large class of inputs, then often you're using regular expressions or some such at the network level and you also block legitimate traffic. We're going to end up evaluating our technique using the same sorts of, uh, same sorts of metrics you would use to evaluate signature generation to wit, the amount of time it takes us to do it, and the uh, number of transactions lost later, and you'll be able to compare for yourself quantitatively whether or not we've done a good job. Right? But we do want to use signature generation. It's orthogonal. Mr. Gowani. Test cases did you have for each of these examples? One so, each. Okay, so one way to measure the robustness of your technique would be the following. You start with more than one negative test case, and I assume that your technique works with one negative test case at a time. So you see if uh, you change the different order of the negative test cases that you consider, and hmm. would all of them end up with the same patch? This is a good idea. Uh, officially, we can actually support multiple negative test cases. We just keep going until you pass every test case. Uh, so having uh, multiple there at the same time doesn't hurt us. Uh, but in some sense, we might, um, we have no reason to believe that our repair operation is distributive. It might be easier for us to fix two things alone uh, than to fix them both at the same time. Uh, your robustness measurement is intriguing. Uh, we should talk after the presentation. So the reason why uh, it occurred to me is because your treatment of negative tests and positive tests was quite different. So what is a negative test is going to become a positive test when you consider the next negative test? Yes. Uh, we... You are correct, yes. Other questions while we're here? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so in general, this worked out relatively well. <clears throat> For us, rather than the lines of code in the program, the size of the weighted path ended up being a big determining factor in how long it took to come up with the repair. Uh, question from the front? No. no. I should wrap up now? No more questions. So our, uh, our scalability is uh, largely related to the length of this weighted path. The length of the weighted path is sort of a proxy for the search space that we have to explore. Here we've plotted a number of things that we can repair, note log log scale. Right? But in general, this is one of the areas where we might use some sort of uh, off-the-shelf a fault localization technique from Tom Ball or whatnot for the cases that have particularly long awaited paths. <clears throat> Certainly. So if you measure the slope of that line, what you find out is that it's 
less than quadratic and a little more than linear in the length of the weighted pad for our small number of data sets. <coughs> so. In general, the repairs that we come up with are not what a human would have done. Uh, for example, I talked about this before, we might add bounds checks to one area in your code rather than rewriting the program to use a safe abstract string class, which is what humans might do when presented with uh, evidence of the bug in one area. <clears throat> it is worth noting that any proposed repair we come up with must pass all of the regression tests that you give us. One way to view this is uh, for one of the things that we repair, this web server, <clears throat> the uh, vulnerability is that it trusts the content length provided by the user. The user can provide uh, a large negative number when posting information, when uploading images or whatnot, uh, allowing the remote user to take control of the web server. If we don't include any regression tests for post functionality, the repair that we come up with very fast is to disable post functionality. We just remove that. You're no longer allowed to do that which in some sense might actually be better than the standard approach of running the server in read-only mode, because in read-only mode you can still get access to confidential information. But in general, we require that the user provide us with a sufficiently rich test suite uh, to ensure all functionality, and that's an orthogonal problem in software engineering. <clears throat> Our minimization process in some sense uh, also prevents gratuitous deletions uh, you know, to functionality. <clears throat> and not shown here, uh, adding more test cases, say moving up to 20 or 100, uh, helps us rather than hurting us. Right, so we still succeed about the same fraction of the time if there are more test cases. <clears throat> so uh, in brief limited time, you might also want to look at repair quality another way. <clears throat> Imagine you're in some sort of e-commerce uh, security setting like your Amazon.com or Pets.com and you're selling dogs to people over the internet. From your perspective, a high quality repair might be one that blocks security attacks while still allowing you to sell as many dogs as possible without reducing transactional throughput. So to test this, to test our uh, repair in sort of a self-healing setting, we integrated with an anomaly intrusion detection system. Right? The basic idea here is we throw an indicative workload at you, and when the anomaly detection system flags a request as possibly an attack, we set it aside and treat it as the buggy test case and try to repair the program so that it's not vulnerable to that. The danger to this is that we can do this repair without humans in the loop. Right? And uh, what? Uh, yes, just dogs in the loop. So let's see how that actually goes. Our experimental setup was to obtain indicative workloads. We then apply the workload to a vanilla server, uh, sped up so that the server is brought to its knees. And the reason we're doing this is so that any additional overhead introduced by the repair process or the patch shows up on measurement. Right? We then uh, send some known attack packet. The intrusion detection system flags it. We take the server down during the repair, measure how many packets we lose then. We apply the repair. And then we send the workload again, right, measuring the throughput after we apply the repair, which is sort of equivalent to measuring the precision uh, of a filter. <clears throat> Does this work? In fact, it worked relatively well. Uh, we started out with workloads, about 140,000 requests for two different web servers. And also, we considered a, a dynamic web application written in PHP that ran on top of web servers, a sort of room and item reservation system. <clears throat> Each row here is individually normalized so that the vanilla version before the repair uh, is considered to have 100% performance. Right? However many requests it's able to serve is the right amount. We send it the indicative workload once, and then we send the attack packet and try to come up with a repair for that attack. In each case, uh, the attacks were again off-the-shelf security vulnerabilities from bug track. We were able to generate one of these repairs. One of the first questions is, how long did it take? Are we as fast as fast signature generation? And assuming that there's one such attack per day, in general, we lose between, let's say, 0 and 3% of your transactional throughput if you take the server down to do the repair. In general, you might imagine having a failover or backup server uh, in read-only mode, say, that might uh, handle requests during this time. So for us, the more important number is what happens after we deploy the repair? Might we deploy low-quality repairs that cause us to fail to sell dogs? And in essence, the answer is no. Uh, any, any transactions or any packets that we lost after applying the repair were totally lost in the noise. And our definition of success was relatively stringent. Uh, success here means not only that we got the output byte for byte correct, but also that we did it in the same amount of time or less than it took the vanilla unmodified program. And uh, the reason for this, the interpretation, is that our uh, positive test cases, the regression tests, prevent us from sacrificing key functionality. There was a question. Well, I use experiment a lot. I wonder if you've considered comparing the throughput reduction with the uh, depth you get from a web application firewall of app. This is a great idea. We had not considered it, but we will now. I think it'll do quite a bit better. 
<clears throat> the question was, could we compare our throughput loss to that of a web application firewall like, and then you named one in particular. Yes, yes, the outputs, we only count it as a successful request if it's exactly the same. Uh, yes, so yes, I will get to this in, in let's say a minute. Uh, <clears throat> this is a great question. Whenever we start using an intrusion or anomaly detection system, false positives become a fact of life. An intrusion detection system might mistakenly point out some innocuous request as if it were an error. So a second set of experiments we did here was, let's take some false positives. Let's take some requests like get index.html that are not actually attacks, pretend they're attacks, and try to repair them and see what happens. Right? Maybe then we come up with a low-quality repair. So we did that three times. We took completely legitimate requests and considered them to be attacks and tried to repair them. Right? In two of the cases, we were actually able to make some sort of repair. And I'll quantify for you in just a second uh, what that might mean. <clears throat> in general, it takes us a long time to come up with repairs for things that aren't actually problems because we have to search through the space until we find some sort of corner case way of, in essence, uh, tabulating, defeating this particular input, but allowing all others to get through. Uh, in fact, in our third false positive, it was, in essence, get index.html, and there was no way to both fail this and also pass this as one of the regression tests, so we couldn't make a repair there. But even for these two times where we did come up with repairs that, in some sense, uh, weren't actually valid or repaired non-bugs, <clears throat> any uh, transactional throughput that we, uh, that we might have suffered at the end was in the noise. Uh, because, again, we have these sort of positive regression test cases that make us keep important behavior around. Um, what are examples of packets that we might lose? Uh, for one of these, the repair involved in some cases uh, dropping the cache control tag from the HTTP response header. Uh, previously, yes, you were allowed to cache it with our bad repair. In some of these cases, no, you weren't allowed to cache it. Uh, so maybe then you have to make extra requests of the server in order to get the same data so you don't get everything done in time, so you drop a few packets there. Can you clarify the... It seems to me you said earlier that you're using the workload of the web uh, problem that yeah. to... Is that, is that your test case? Is that your no. Is this is a great question. No. No, no, no. Uh, I would... So we have uh, five separate test cases, get index.html, post my name and copy it back to me, uh, get a directory, get a GIF, and get a file that's not found. Those are our five test cases. Okay, and, and those are the ones you're using for the... For yes, the, those are the ones we check every time. So yes. So the repair never sees these 138,000 requests in our... Yes. Sorry. I, so among these, this, this test workload here, Yes. There are how many, what's the percentage of malicious, so to speak? Uh, one out of 138,000. The workload is entirely benign. We play the workload once. We send the attack, and then we play the workload again. And the, the attack is what exactly? The attack is an off-the-shelf exploit from bug track. Uh, it varies by different, which program? The previous question, different from the single, basically, uh, failing test case that you use for generating the repair. Uh, no. Exactly the same as uh, it becomes the negative test case that we use to generate the repair. Exactly the same, that there's only one of them, there are variants of them. That's what I'm... Uh, what would defeat the trivial solution of just blocking that specific input? In this experiment, if you did the trivial solution of blocking that particular input, you would get a high score. We did not do the trivial solution of blocking that particular input. Uh, which you cannot tell from this chart, but I assert and we describe qualitatively in text. Yes. The yes. have been done, doing really well in that, for that specific experiment setup. Right. Uh, and, and in essence, what we want to say is the trivial solution would do really well. Uh, perfect filtering would do really well. We also do really well, but we are repairing the problem and not just putting a Band-Aid on top, or so we claim. You are implicitly giving a lot of weight to small changes, essentially. Or maybe, uh, you know, the statement that you said you're only going to insert or delete, you're not going to invent new code. We're not going to invent new code, right. <clears throat> so, uh, other limitations beyond those that have been brought out by astute audience members. 
One is that we uh, can't handle non-deterministic faults. We run your program in all the test cases and assume that's going to tell us whether it's correct or not. And if you had something like a race condition, uh, running it once might not uh, be able to tell us what's going on. Right? Now, we did handle multi-threaded programs like web servers, but those aren't really multi-threaded because the copies don't actually communicate with each other in any interesting way. A long-term potential solution to this might be to put scheduler constraints, perhaps related to controlling interleavings, into the variant representation so that a repair would be both change these five lines of code and also instruct the virtual machine not to do the following scheduler swap. Right. Future work. We also assume that the uh, buggy test case visits different lines of code than the normal regression test cases. For something like a cross-site scripting attack or a SQL code injection vulnerability, that would not be the case. Right? Uh, and then our weighted path wouldn't be a good way to uh, narrow down the search space. And in such an area, we might want to use an off-the-shelf uh, fault localization approach like Tomball's. <clears throat> Finally, we also assume that existing statements in the program can help form the repair. Currently, we're working on uh, some notion of repair templates, uh, something like typed runtime code generation. Sort of the essence of a null check is if some hole is not null, then some hole for statements. <clears throat> we can imagine either hand crafting those or mining them from version control repositories. Maybe you work in a company where there have been a lot of changes related to switching over to wide character support, moving from printf to WS printf. If we notice that other divisions are doing that, then maybe we can suggest that as repairs for you. <clears throat> Sir? In connection to your dog example, so you worried about whether dogs are sold or not. Yes. Instead, you may worry about how many dogs are sold. So in this connection, there is one generalization instead of test being yes, no. Test could be numbers. Numbers. Yes. How well do you pass the test? And then you can optimize. Yes. Uh, one of, so this is a good idea. One of the reasons that we haven't pursued it experimentally is that in the open source world, it is hard to find test cases that are that fine-grained, that have a, a real number value rather than yes or no. Uh, but Microsoft may well have them, and uh, before everyone leaves, there will be sort of a begathon where I ask for a... <clears throat> yes, the real reason we're here, help from Microsoft. <clears throat> so uh, the work that I've presented here covers actually two papers and more uh, ICSI work that we'll be presenting in a few days, which in essence describes our repair algorithm, uh, the, you know, the test cases that we use, the repair quality, answers the question, does this approach work at all? It's controversial, you know, yes, it looks like it does. We have a second paper in the Genetic and Evolutionary Computing Conference uh, coming out a bit later, which answers questions related to uh, our uh, crossover and mutation operations. Is this really evolutionary computing, uh, or is this perhaps just random search? Right? <clears throat> what are the effects of more test cases? What's the scaling behavior? Questions more related to why does this work? <clears throat> in general, though, we claim that we can automatically and efficiently repair certain classes of bugs in off-the-shelf legacy programs. Right? We use regression tests to encode the desired behavior and also to focus the search on parts of the program that we view are more likely to contain the bugs. So we use regression tests rather than, say, manual annotations. <clears throat> and I encourage difficult questions, and there have been a number already. <clears throat> Any last questions? Let's take a few more minutes to ask you know, particularly tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> so far, though. So you know, you know, let's Puffies. take the growth off. Uh, I would love to, I mean, ideally, of course, you would like to have proof that uh, for, I mean, that you have more verification because to test the, the, the repaired program is actually uh, uh, semantically equivalent, functionally equivalent to the, 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 the faulty one minus... Except one thing, okay. yeah. So, but how are you, are you planning, I mean, what are your thoughts about that challenge? Right. Um, so we have some previous work for automatically generating repairs in the presence of a specification where the repair provably adheres to the specification and doesn't introduce any new violations. One of the things we wanted to do here was see how far we could get without specifications. Without specifications, it's harder to talk about things like proof. One of the directions we've been considering instead is documentation. And we have some previous work that was successful at automatically generating documentation for object-oriented programs. Could we extend that work to automatically document what we think is going on in the exception, or sorry, what we think is going on in the repair, and then it might be even easier for the developer to say, uh, no, the tool is way off, I don't want to do this, or oh, this is the right idea, but I should add one more line or some such. Uh, we have also been considering, imagine someone has uh, some specifications, but not all of them, and also some <laughs> test cases. <laughs> I know, I know, it's hard to believe. 
Uh, and then uh, also some test cases. Is there some way we could incorporate information from uh, specifications into our fitness function, right? Or to sort of guide the repair. Uh, so if we do have any sort of partial correctness specification, we can be certain that we never generate a repair that causes a tool or a model checker to think that the resulting program violates a partial correctness specification, assuming they're present. Right. Okay, so the gloves are off. More questions. Yeah, so um, maybe I missed that part, but a critical part seems to be which tests you pick, the, the positive test case, because in reality, I, I don't know any particle only has five test cases, right. which are representative, and then multiplied by the number of, yes. I see where I'm going, right? My I can see where you're time. going. So it might take a very long time. So in fact, we have current work not described here on using, in essence, either randomization or test suite reduction. There's been a lot of previous work in the software engineering community on, uh, let's say, time-aware test suite prioritization, maybe using knapsack solvers, maybe using other approaches to perhaps order test cases by code coverage, maybe doing the first ones and then sort of uh, bailing out in a short-circuit manner if you fail some obvious test at the beginning. Uh, we have a student currently working on, uh, let's imagine you have 100 test cases, uh, subsampling for each fitness evaluation, just pick 10 of them or just pick five of them, use that for your fitness score, but then if you think you've won, then we run you on all 100 of them. Thus far, using relatively simple techniques like that, we've been able to get 95% performance improvements. Right? Uh, so we have reason to believe that we might be able to apply off-the-shelf software engineering uh, test suite reduction techniques in the case where you have hundreds, of th hundreds or thousands of test cases rather than five. Yes. You, the, that was the, the yes. sigh of I'm not convinced or? Well, there's many issues with running test cases. And, I mean, you're assuming the test cases actually were written. You might just try to destroy the machine. Or I, I, you, you're, you're assuming that your test cases, if I understand correctly, for this to work, and that they are really hard, they are very low level, and they qualify quite a bit the output. So for that specific concrete input, I mean, very specified, completely defined input, I get that completely defined output. You cannot have a test case say, oh, the output has to be greater than zero for it. You could. Totally good. But then it's not going to work because it's going to be, you, you could very well then generate basically a lot of different repairs that are going to basically, and then the repair program will be completely different functionally speaking than the original one. You see what I'm getting uh, at? Yes. So we have not studied that. Uh, again, we claim that if you, uh, if what you really want the program to be doing is not returning any number greater than zero, then your test case shouldn't just pass it if it returns any number greater than zero. We'd say it's, it's your responsibility to make a more precise test case in that scenario. So when you're saying you're, you will be sampling dynamically based on, based on the fault, mm -hmm. that might be very expensive by itself. Uh, if but less big... expensive than a retest all methodology, yes, which is what we're currently doing. Right? Um, it, it might still be expensive, um, but we are still in the early stages of dealing with programs with more test cases. And one of the reasons that we're still in the early st uh, stages is that they don't exist in the open source world. Uh, so if you in Microsoft have many test cases uh, and you would like to contribute to a worthy goal, you might want to consider. Uh, on the wrong side of the <laughs> if we had an exhaustive test case, we would need this to repair. We have a, basically a general a formula representing the entire program and so we could massage it to equivalent checking, etc. The, the converse of that is that if you had a formal specification, you also wouldn't need any repairs. Right. So. Um, other questions after this commercial break? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, one way of, uh, of trying to minimize the impact of a change you make is just to look at how much of the global state gets affected because of the patch that you generate. Yes. I, I mean, I, the reason I ask this is, suppose uh, you, know, you, you pass the test cases, but you introduce some behavior that only shows when you run the program for long, like a memory leak, or yes. uh, you know, it changes the file system or something like that. So you, ideally speaking, you want to minimize the impact that the program has on Yes. So is that something you've considered? This is a good idea. Would we notice if we, int if we added a memory leak? And we probably would not unless you already had a test case for it. Officially, uh, as is standard test case practice, all of these test cases should be run uh, in a change-rooted jail or in a virtual machine or whatnot, lest we introduce the command rm star dot star. Um, <clears throat> If we're already run, running under a virtual machine, then uh, checking things like uh, memory, memory areas that you're touching is, uh, is potentially more feasible. We have not thought about this, but this is a great idea. We should look more into it. <clears throat> Other questions? Well, let me ask you one question before we go. So I think your premise has been that uh, programs contain seeds of their own repair. Let me take an issue with that premise. Yes. Some programs are basically irreparably bad. They're just hmm. horrible. 
So in those cases, would it be possible to use uh, the abundance of code and programs you have of that particular kind, say on SourceForge or some such, to introduce some sort of some form of cross pollination? This, uh, I think, the answer to this is yes. This would be a good idea. Uh, we had not thus far considered it. We'd been sort of stuck in our repair templates mode. Uh, where you can see some of the seeds of this, as it were, seeing from a different division in your company to bring over repairs. Uh, but in essence, this is a, a, a different question, which is when we're doing you know, mutation to insert statements, might we draw from a different statement bank than the original program, maybe a better high-quality statement bank, or one that has been winnowed down to contain only good stuff or whatnot. Um, it's a great idea. We have not considered it, but it is likely that it would do better than what we're doing now. Okay, well, let's take it again.